Hello and welcome to Background Briefing, available 24-7 at backgroundbriefing.org. I'm Ian Masterson. Today we'll examine a number of stories and issues in the news. We'll begin with revelations from a joint investigation by CBS's 60 Minutes, Der Spiegel and The Insider, that the AHI, anomalous health incidents known as Havana Syndrome, which have incapacitated a number of high-ranking U.S. intelligence officials serving abroad, were caused by a directed energy weapon wielded by members of Russia's military intelligence GRU unit 29155. Joining us is Michael Weiss, editor at The Insider, a Russian-focused independent media outlet who has reported on international affairs for over 10 years with a focus on the Middle East and Russia. He has interviewed ISIS operatives and Russian spies, published and curated a series of still-classified KGB training manuals, reported from rebel-held Syria and war-torn Ukraine, broken major stories about financial corruption, and exposed the Russian intelligence service's ongoing subversion efforts in the United States and Europe. He's the author of The Menace of Unreality, How Russia Weaponizes Information, Culture and Money, and co-authored the New York Times bestseller ISIS, Inside the Army of Terror. We'll discuss his article at The Insider, Unraveling Havana Syndrome, New Evidence Links the GRU's Assassination Unit 29155 to Mysterious Attacks on U.S. Officials and Their Families. Then we'll speak with Marcy Shaw, a professor of history at Yale University, who teaches the intellectual history of 20th and 21st century Central and Eastern Europe. She's the author of Caviar and Ashes, A Warsaw Generation's Life and Death in Marxism, 1918 to 1968, The Taste of Ashes, The Afterlife of Totalitarianism in Eastern Europe, and The Ukrainian Night, An Intimate History of Revolution, just out in an updated paperback version. She is just back from Ukraine, and we'll discuss her article at CNN, The Heroism of Ukraine and the Nihilism of Mike Johnson. Then finally, we'll speak with Stephen Hahn, a Pulitzer Prize-winning historian who studies American political and social movements and teaches at New York University. His acclaimed works include A Nation Under Our Feet and A Nation Without Borders, and his latest book just out is Illiberal America, A History. We'll discuss how the recent alarm about the resurgence of illiberal democracy with Trump's capture of the GOP is seen as a departure from American tradition, but in fact it may be more of a recurring theme in American history. And before we begin, I would like to thank our listener donors who keep background briefing independent, corporate, and commercial free without paywalls or constant fundraising by making tax deductible donations to our nonprofit foundation, the Public Truth Media Foundation, at publictruthmedia.org or at backgroundbriefing.org slash donate. As we enter this fact-free and violence-prone election year with much of the country under the cult-like spell of a deranged demagogue spewing constant lies while inciting hatred and violence, help us continue to seek out facts and information to awaken America's silent majority before our democracy is trumped by fascism. And joining us now is Michael Weiss, the editor of At The Insider, a Russia-focused independent media outlet that has reported on international affairs for over 10 years with a focus on the Middle East and Russia. He has interviewed ISIS operatives and Russian spies, published and curated a series of still-classified KGB training manuals, reported from rebel-held Syria and war-torn Ukraine, broken major stories about financial corruption and exposed the Russian intelligence service's ongoing subversion efforts in the United States and Europe. He's the author of The Menace of Unreality, How Russia Weaponizes Information, Culture and Money, and the co-author of the New York Times bestseller, ISIS, Inside the Army of Terror. And he has an article at The Insider, Unraveling Havana Syndrome. New evidence links the GRU Assassination Unit 29155 to mysterious attacks on U.S. officials and their families. Welcome to Background Briefing, Michael Weiss. Good to be back on here. Well, thanks for joining us, Michael, and you've been busy in in a year-long investigation by The Insider in collaboration with CBS's 60 Minutes and Der Spiegel, and you've uncovered an explanation for what uh, has been a mystery for some time known as Havana Syndrome, and it apparently is, you've discovered or revealed that the Russians have been using a directed energy weapon used by members of Russia's GRU, that's Military Intelligence Unit, 29155. So tell us about this mysterious unit, because they've been tied to the Skripal poisoning and other 
nefarious activities. Yeah, that's right, Ian. Um, so Unit 29155 uh, is actually a subunit of uh, Russian military intelligence, which had been created initially as a, a training unit for Russian spies, but was rebranded um, or reconstituted in 2009 under the command of General Andrei Avrianov, who is uh, still the commander of the unit, as a, um, a special task um, unit, which is to say, I mean, this Russian spy parlance for these guys do kinetic operations acts of terrorism, assassination. In one instance, uh, they, they orchestrated a, a failed coup uh, in Montenegro on the eve of that country's accession to NATO. Um, all of this stuff has been reported by the insider in con- collaboration with Bellingcat over the years. You mentioned the Skripal poisoning. They've also poisoned a Bulgarian arms dealer, Emilian Gebrev. And uh, as we broke recently, a few months ago, they were responsible for a series of explosions of ammunition and weapons depots across Bulgaria and the Czech Republic beginning actually in 2011. Um, but this investigation was interesting because when we, we started working with 60 Minutes, we didn't assume or even think that 29155 um, had any hand in, in what's colloquially known as Havana syndrome, but officially the U.S. government calls them anomalous health incidents. Um, but then we started to uncover data. Uh, in the form of intercepted um, communications, which had uh, very interesting attachments. So there's one guy who's a a member of the unit, um, also a military engineer, uh, Colonel Terentiev, who we noticed had been promoted from the GRU to Vladimir Putin's uh, personal envoy to a far eastern region in Russia. It's kind of a plum assignment because his role was that of federal inspector, and these are the guys who basically oversee the governors of the the region. Um, And this is kind of an odd thing because usually GRU assassins and saboteurs don't take on political roles. And we started wondering why why was this guy getting promoted? His his aide or his deputy was also promoted to a a similar assignment. And we noticed um, in the back and forth with the Kremlin Anti-Corruption Office, believe it or not, there is such a thing, that he had to account for a disbursement of of money, which he'd received for a special research project he had um, engaged in with the Ministry of Defense. And he attached an addendum of that project describing its contents. And it was about the potentialities for the use of non-lethal acoustic weapons in an urban warfare environment. Well, that's interesting because if you read and we have a link to it in our story. The um, U.S. intelligence community's um, expert panel report on the possible causes of Havana syndrome. This was released in September of 2022. It was classified, but then a redacted version was uh, obtained through a Freedom of Information Act. Uh, one of the uh, plausible explanations for AHI uh, is acoustic weapons, um, either ultrasonic um, you know, uh, devices that could enter into the inner ear and cause the kind of damage we see, the, the core characteristics, as the, the study puts it, um, consistent with Havana syndrome. Another hypothesized plausible explanation for what causes this is a pulse microwave. So we then started looking at, well, let's see if we can find any examples of 29155 operatives traveling to or appearing in the vicinity of um, alleged attacks. Um, And if you watch the 60 Minutes broadcast, one of the victims of um, or sufferers of AHI was in Tbilisi, Georgia in uh, 2021. She is the wife of a Department of Justice attache who was stationed at the uh, U.S. Embassy in Tbilisi. And she was in perfectly fine form, physical condition. And one day in the middle of taking the laundry out of the dryer in her house, um, there's a window in that laundry room that opens out into the, the front of the house. She started to experience these terrible pains, intense pressure in her head, uh, I think ringing in, in her ears. She went into the bathroom and projectile vomited. Uh, and then she ran outside thinking that something untoward had been happening to her. And she noticed a guy, very, very tall man, um, actually young man, uh, blonde hair, getting into a Mercedes crossover. and um, we showed her a picture of um, Albert Abrianov. That is the son of the aforementioned Andre Abrianov. So in other words, the son of the commander of Unit 29155. Uh, and she said that she had a visceral reaction looking at that photograph 
because that looks exactly like the guy she saw right outside her house, right around the time of the attack. And what's interesting, two U.S. government officials told us they placed Albert Avrianov in Tbilisi, Georgia at the time of the attack. We were able to establish that both Albert and his father traveled to um, Tashkent, uh, Uzbekistan. And from there, the phone for Albert goes dark for exactly the time period that he would have been in Tbilisi um, conducting both this attack and there was another reported incident of Havana syndrome there. Um, so we also were able to more definitively prove that another guy, Igor Gordienko, who's a member of 29155, was traveling uh, in and out of Germany and other um, European countries around the time of a much earlier attack. The reason it's called Havana syndrome is that the, the first publicized reported cases uh, were from Havana, Cuba in 2016, 2017. Um, loads of diplomats, CIA officers started experiencing these strange symptoms. But in fact, we were able to prove um, that the first or one of the first cases, and we saw the medical records of this person, was someone who was working out of the U.S. consulate in Frankfurt, Germany in 2014. Um, and uh, this person was, was targeted or hit in November. So that's several months after Russia's first invasion of Ukraine, the annexation of Crimea. And in October, or a few weeks before this attack, this person, um, we, call, we call them Taylor in the report um, because they are still in U.S. government. This person noticed a man who she has identified as Igor Gordienko skulking around outside of U.S. consulate housing and clocking cars with diplomatic plates. In fact, this person confronted Gordienko and he sort of muttered something in Russian and then ran off. So we have two eyewitnesses saying that they've seen two members of 29155 either at the midst, in the midst of their attack or thereabouts or just before. Um, this is, for us, very compelling evidence, uh, because one of the things the U.S. government has said before in its investigation into Havana syndrome, well, yes, we can find GRU uh, registered cars or GRU officers kind of sort of in the areas where these incidents have taken place, but we just think they were there for espionage purposes. 29155 does not do pure espionage. Uh, if they're there reconnoitering something, uh, it's because they plan something kinetic, which is to say violent. Uh, so, you know, we, we piece together all of this data. We incorporate also some of the research that has been conducted for decades, really, by first the Soviet Union and then Russian, the Russian Federation. There was a Soviet program called Operation Reductor or Gearbox, which was a classified program based in an institute in Kharkiv, uh, which is Ukraine. Uh, that essentially tested microwave uh, radiation on lab rats, monkeys. And we're, we're, the, the express purpose of this program was to see how it could influence human behavior and what kind of effects this would have on the human body and human biology. So people who say, well, you know, the Russians, well, they're not doing anything like this. Well, they are. They're, they're definitely experimenting and researching. Now, what we don't have, uh, and by, this is by no means a conclusive investigation, and we don't pretend that it is, we don't have a device in our hands or a photograph of it, and we don't literally have a Russian spy or operative pulling the trigger of the device. But as I say, I think we have shown a little more granularly and with more, I think, compelling evidence that, um, you know, Russia has long been suspected of being behind Havana syndrome. The lead DIA investigator, which is to say the Defense Intelligence Agency's investigators on 60 Minutes, a guy called Greg Ed Green, former lieutenant colonel in the Army, and his comment to 60 Minutes was, it's the Russians. If it's not the Russians, I'll come back on your show and I'll eat my tie. Mm -hmm. Well, 29155, attributing to them, makes much more sense to us because, as I say, their remit um, is, is is to do these kinds of things, is, is to inflict casualties or to assassinate people or to conduct military acts aimed at destabilizing the West. So the victim in Tbilisi, Joy, did she see mm. anything in the hands of Albert Avrianov, the son of the, the head of the unit? She, 
she doesn't say that she saw anything in the hands of, of, of Albert, but I mean, the way it would have worked is he wouldn't be the only one, right? Uh, 29155, we go to great lengths to show their tradecraft. Um, they operate in teams. Some teams come in um, to do the reconnaissance or the target selection uh, to survey sort of the operational playing field, as it were. Other teams come in and are really kind of decoys throw off the scent of European counterintelligence. So they never fly direct to a destination. They go to some midpoint. Uh, they often rent multiple hotel rooms and keep their reservations. They rent cars. They travel by plane, by rail, by automobile. So if Albert was there, he wasn't there alone. And I mean, indeed, we have evidence or we have reason to believe, I should say, that, uh, that he was there with, with his colleagues at the time. So initially in Cuba, when the, the term Havana Syndrome was coined, the assumption was that these weapons were using were being used to extract uh, intelligence from inside U.S. buildings. But it looks as if what the purpose of these uh, weapons is to simply disable American right. uh, operatives in the field. Is that is that what it's all about? Well, we believe so. I mean, again, you know, we're we're operating on on data and and the evidence before us. I mean, in, in terms of the motive, as I say, uh, the the Soviet and Russian research was exactly that to see what kind of biological effects it would have um, on animals and humans. Uh, but if you think about it, it it makes sense, right? Um, it's a it's a non lethal weapon, so you're not killing people. So the, the, the escalation is somewhat mitigated. Um, the, the people who are being attacked, by the way, uh, the, the cases we've looked at and also people we've talked to both in the intelligence community and in the scientific and medical community say many of these victims are longtime Russia subject matter specialists. So there's CIA officers who have worked in Russia or who have worked in uh, former Warsaw Pact form, or former Soviet countries. Um, which Russia has a vested strategic interest in seeing outside of the Western orbit. Um, you know, they were at the top of their game. In other words, um, a lot of these CIA guys were either incoming chiefs of station or deputy chiefs of station. They, um, in one case, Mark Palmeropoulos had traveled officially to Moscow to liaise with his Russian counterparts, the FSB and the SVR to discuss counterterrorism of all things when Mark was hit in his hotel room. And Mark was there as a CIA officer, not undercover. Um, they knew who he was. So he, you know, this was not some kind of mission he was on. And yet, you know, he was the equivalent of a four-star general, had, had uh, served all over the Middle East, including in Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, has been in very stressful environments, never seemed to have any kind of psychosomatic symptoms uh, consistent with what we know AHI to be. Um, and he had to be medically retired from the CIA because of this. Um, and he was at the time the, the head of operations for um, European and Eurasian uh, affairs at the CIA. So we, we also look at a, a cluster uh, of attacks um, around the 2021 period. Uh, and a lot of them we noticed were of CIA officers who were veterans or graduates of Kiev Station. So in other words, they were based in Kiev, Ukraine, right after the Euromaidan revolution um, and the ouster of Viktor Yanukovych and Ukraine's basically it's it slip away from the Russian orbit. And what's very interesting is the New York Times did a, a very good deep dive investigation several weeks ago showing that um, the CIA station in Kiev put in the plumbing, as one of uh, intelligence officer put it to us, for a, a very elaborate and uh, extensive collaboration between the agency and Ukraine's military intelligence agency, GUR. Um, and these guys have basically trained up GUR commandos, including um, the now head of GUR, Kirill Bodanov. Um, GUR is now conducting really kind of incredible attacks against Russia inside Russia, using drones to strike oil refineries, strategic rail is very far afield from the front lines in Siberia. Um, they're assassinating people who are part of the war machinery in Russia uh, to say nothing of what they're doing in their own country against the Russians. So uh, it, it kind of all falls into place. Um, the American intelligence officers who helped Ukraine create its antibodies for Russian war and occupation, they get sent on other assignments. One went to Tashkent, one went to Vienna, 
Um, one was the incoming chief of station in Hanoi, Vietnam, and all of them got hit or their family got hit. In one case, um, the wife of a CIA officer who herself is a CIA officer was uh, targeted and hit in London. So it's very interesting. Um, it, you know, it, 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 if, if other countries, if other foreign adversaries were, were interested in taking these particular chess pieces off the board, um, they're, they're not doing a very good job for their own national security because these chess pieces have to be, happen to be very focused on what Moscow is up to. So, Michael, well, just in closing then, the AHI, Anomalous Health Incidents, which is how these attacks on U.S. intelligence personnel have been categorized. Um, mm. There's been resistance, right, to, oh, yeah. for medical care. And I'm not sure whether it's it's bureaucratic or whether it's because they don't want to pay out a lot of money or what. But now that you, uh, you along with CBS of 60 Minutes and Dish Beagle and one of your colleagues, of course, is Krista Grosseff from Bellingcat, who broke the story of how the FSB tried to assassinate Navalny in great detail. So this is pretty solid stuff. Is that going to change, move the needle on getting proper medical care and compensation for these victims of these directed energy attacks? Well, in 2021, uh, the Biden administration, uh, or the President Biden, rather, uh, passed the Havana, signed into law the Havana Act, which does provide compensation for some, but not all, victims of AHI. So some of them are getting care. Some of them are getting money. I mean, one of the, the, the cynical interpretations, or I, I should say um, denials that this thing even exists, is that, well, you know, people are looking to cash in, they're, they're having these psychosomatic dramas and, and then, you know, seeking compensation from the government. $100,000, which is basically what most of the victims have received, is uh, pennies compared to what they could have been making had they completed their term, particularly in the CIA, but also in the State Department. I mean, some people are so uh, medically disabled from their condition that they can't really work. They're making a fraction of what they, they used to make. One patient who goes by the name of Adam publicly, he's just been interviewed by Fox News. He was patient zero in Havana. I think he lost sight in one of his eyes. He has to walk with a weighted vest because he has such bad cases of vertigo. Uh, I, I've interviewed him many, many times. Um, this is a guy who would gladly return whatever money the U.S. government has paid him as part of the Havana Act to have his life back and to have his career back. So, no, I don't think this is some kind of, um, you know, sociogenic illness, as, as some have hypothesized. I think it's very real. And, you know, others say, well, how come they're only targeting Americans? Well, in fact, they're not. Uh, quite a lot of cases uh, are of Canadian diplomats and Canadian intelligence officers. In fact, I've, I've just been speaking the other day to a, Can a Canadian attorney who's representing them. So that's another story, another piece of the puzzle that kind of gets um, obscured or I should say, probably concealed um, when we talk about Havana syndrome. But um, yeah, I mean, look, it's either the, the largest and most coordinated outbreak of mass hysteria known to man, and again, affecting a very, very specific subset of a community, Russia hands, who with decades of experience, uh, and in many cases at the top of their game, uh, or something untoward is going on. And, uh, you know, guess who's responsible for it? Well, Marco Weiss, I thank you very much for joining us here today. Sure, anytime. Well, thank you again, Michael. Again, Michael Weiss is the editor at The Insider, Russia-focused independent media outlet who has reported on international affairs for over 10 years with a focus on the Middle East and Russia. He's interviewed ISIS operatives and Russian spies, published and curated a series of still-classified KGB training manuals reported from rebel-held Syria and war-torn Ukraine, broken major stories about financial corruption, and exposed the Russian intelligence services' ongoing subversion efforts in the United States and Europe. And he's the author of The Menace of Run Reality, How Russia Weaponizes Information, Culture and Money, and the co-author of the New York Times bestseller ISIS, Inside the Army of Terror. And he has an article at The Insider, Unraveling Havana Syndrome, New Evidence Links the GRU's Assassination Unit 29155 to Mysterious Attacks on U.S. Officials and Their Families. 
We're going to take a brief station break. We're back with a scholar who teaches the intellectual history of 20th and 21st century Central and Eastern Europe, who is just back from Ukraine, and we'll discuss her article at CNN, The Heroism of Ukraine and the Nihilism of Mike Johnson. Welcome back. I'm Ian Masters, and this is Background Briefing, available 24-7 at backgroundbriefing.org. And joining us now is Marcy Shaw, a professor of history at Yale University, who teaches the intellectual history of 20th and 21st century Central and Eastern Europe. She's the author of Caviar and Ashes, A Warsaw Generation's Life and Death in Marxism, 1918 to 1968, The Taste of Ashes, The Afterlife of Totalitarianism in Eastern Europe, and The Ukrainian Night, An Intimate History of Revolution, which is now just out in paperback. And she has an article at CNN, The Heroism of Ukraine and the Nihilism of Mike Johnson. Welcome to Background Briefing, Marcy Shaw. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me, Ian. Well, thanks for talking uh, with us, uh, Marcy, particularly since you just returned from uh, Kiev after an extraordinary journey into Ukraine at war. So let's talk about what it take, takes to get into Ukraine after the long flight and then crossing Poland and then crossing into uh, Ukraine itself. Well, I would first say that you know, the challenge of getting into Ukraine at the moment is that you can't fly because the airports are closed. They're not safe. So you have to go by land. So it's time consuming. It was not particularly difficult per se. It was just time consuming. So I flew, I, I was with my friend Amelia Glazier, um, a Slavicist we studied together back in the 90s. She's a professor at uh, UCSD and she does a lot of translation from Ukrainian and Russian and Yiddish. And so we flew, we met at JFK. We flew JFK to Warsaw. Then we took a Polish train from Warsaw to Helm which is a town very close to the Polish-Ukrainian border. And then we took an overnight Ukrainian train that went from Helm all the way into Kiev. And that was about 13 hours, including a few hours at the border for a passport check. But what's extraordinary is that you portray the city, Kiev, where missiles rain down, uh, nevertheless people going about their lives, restaurants, new galleries open. Describe what it seems to be an extraordinary vital life in the face of, of reigning death. It is extraordinary. And I would say to some extent that determination to live and for life to go on is in spite of the war. And in some sense, it is you know, directly in response to the war. And Kiev is an incredibly intellectually and culturally vibrant city with all sorts of great, you know, art exhibits going on and poetry readings and cultural events and lectures. I mean, to some extent, you know, my reasons for wanting to go were, were very selfish. I mean, selfish, not in the sense of you know, career or financial opportunism, but selfish in the sense of intellectually selfish, because there's a feeling that intellectual life is so intense at the moment. Again, not that despite the war, but in some ways, because of the war, you know, it has focused people. Um, there, there's also the sense that what struck me as soon as I got there was how people were used to the war and had developed a way of living with it. Not that they accepted it, not that they were happy about it, not that it wasn't a big deal, but there was definitely a sense that they were used to it. For instance, everybody knows about missiles. You know, everybody, like the poets, the artists, the waiters, the cab drivers, everyone can distinguish the different kinds of missiles. How Amelia and I were at this, this cafe at a bookstore um, talking to a poet who, whose work Amelia was interested in translating, and the air raid siren went off. And, of course, you know, our feeling as Americans was we should immediately rush to the bomb shelter. And the poet you know, looks at her, looks at the telegram channel as the information is coming in. And she said, oh, it's this kind of missile. You know, we have half an hour before it gets here. We can finish our coffee. 
Oh, my God. So the, the, tell us about these important uh, apps that you have, that Ukrainians have, to tell them where the missiles are coming from and where they're likely to land. Yeah, no, this was very interesting to me, and I think will be of interest to, to future historians. So everybody has these air raid apps. You know, I can't, I mean, this is such a very particular, you know, modern or postmodern moment. You have these air raid apps on your phone, you know, and so when there's an air raid siren, that there's, there's a siren in the city in general that you hear outside, but also it comes through everybody's phone. Um, and then it tells you, you know, air raid siren, please proceed to the bomb shelter, you know, and it, it will then tell you when the air raid is over that, you know, okay, the air raid alarm is over. You may now leave the bomb shelter. And then all the air raid apps say, may the force be with you at the close of the air raid, um, at the close of the air raid siren. I don't know if this is related to the fact that Mark Hamill, the actor who played Luke Skywalker, has been doing outreach for Ukraine. Um, perhaps there's some connection. Because to me, the may the force be with you is a slogan from my childhood. I was the generation who grew up with Star Wars. Um, but it's now on everybody's app, may the force be with you. And there's a slight you know, sense of humor about it, which is one of the things I particularly love about Ukraine. The air raid app also tells you how long the air raid lasted, you know, and says this lasted for 49 minutes or this lasted for three hours and 21 minutes. Um, and, and then in addition to the air raid apps, there are telegram channels with varieties of crowdsourced information where you can follow that, you know, the more specific information about what kind of missile it is and how many and where was it spotted and is it changing directions and where are the safest places to be. You know, and so everybody is also used to continually and obsessively following these apps and wherever you are, Everybody knows that at any given moment, anything can be interrupted by this air raid alarm. So you know, Amelia was giving this lecture at the Fulbright offices about Melnitsky and, uh, and uh, Maria Shuvalova, who was the young literary critic who was leading that, said, OK, before we get started, you know, just a couple you know, information points. If there's an air raid siren, we all go this way. We go down here. You know, there will be coffee downstairs. But, you know, please take your chair with you or the chairs are already set up. So everyone has also gotten used to having this dual existence underground at every event and conference and gallery. You know, there's there's a whole other kind of you know, parallel world going on in a bomb shelter where things have been set up as best as they can be so that life can continue during the air raids. Well, what's extraordinary is that so many, in fact, the majority of these missiles coming in from Putin's missiles coming in from Russia are intercepted by the Patriot systems and others. And because of the holdup with Mike Johnson in the House holding up the aid, the most critical component of this aid are to replenish the ammunition of these anti-aircraft, anti-missile systems. And once they get depleted, then the missiles will come through and, and wreak tremendous havoc. So, I mean, it couldn't be more critical to the survival of Ukraine and the Ukrainian people. But there's a pro-Putin caucus that not only is Trump telling Mike Johnson what to do, he's got this pro-Putin caucus. You know, Marjorie Taylor Greene's already filed paperwork to vacate him from the speakership. And you've got in the House, you've got Chip Roy, Warren Davidson, Tom Tiffany, Matt Rosendale, Tom Massey, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Andy Biggs, Eric Burleson and Clay Higgins, all of whom voted against a resolution to condemn Russia's abduction of Ukrainian children. That gives you an idea where they're coming from. And in the Senate, you've got the pro-Putin caucus of J.D. Vance, Ron Johnson and Rand Paul, who personally hand-delivered a secret me message uh, a letter from Trump to Putin, which is how they, you know, God knows what was in that message. So these are, this is what you're up against in this country. Can this tyranny of the minority be overcome? I mean, uh, well, do you think Mike Johnson, I mean, is the possibility that Mike Johnson may just have to work with the Democrats and take his chances on having uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene trying to kick him out of the, ha of the speakership? Uh, the question, can it be overcome, is excellent. I have to believe there is some way, and I have been tearing my hair out, banging my head against the wall, and not just me, but you know, millions literally of other people you know, have been doing the same thing, saying, how is it that we have this 
handful of sadistic lunatics that are holding the world hostage. It's, it's completely insane. I mean, it just in three hours, you know, on a Thursday morning two weeks ago, between 3 and 6 a.m., you know, the Kremlin sent 31 missiles just to Kiev. You know, and in fact, all Ukrainian air defense shot down all 31 of them, which is extraordinary. They've gotten very good at shooting these things down. There are still injuries and a lot of damage because the, the pieces fall out of the sky. Um, and and they're running out they're running out of air defense ammunition, you know. And you're watching your friends sitting in these bomb shelters, knowing that with each missile that gets shot down, they are you know one piece of ammunition closer to running out. And then you have these Trumpists playing whatever bizarre, perverse games they're playing in our Congress that are holding millions of people hostage, and it, it's. It's revolting. Like, I, if I had a solution for how to get us out of the situation, I would. I can't, I don't know exactly what combination of factors, you know, gives Putin this hold over Trump and his people. And sometimes it doesn't matter. It doesn't even really matter, you know, who's being paid and who has some crazy ideological affinity. You know, the point is, is that you know, we're being held hostage by a handful of sadistic lunatics and their regimes. You know, and the the world needs to figure out a way out of this dilemma. Well, indeed, Marcy, and I thank you for joining us, and I appreciate your first-hand account of having been there recently and seeing what the brave people in Ukraine endure while our good Christian leader of the House dithers. Thanks again. Oh, thank you so much, Ian. And again, I've been speaking with Marcy Shaw, who's a professor of history at Yale University who teaches the intellectual history of 20th and 21st century Central and Eastern Europe. She's the author of Caviar and Ashes, A Warsaw's Generation's Life and Death in Marxism, 1918 to 1968, The Taste of Ashes, The Afterlife of Totalitarianism in Eastern Europe, and The Ukrainian Night, An Intimate History of Revolution, now just out in paperback. And she has an article at CNN, The Heroism of Ukraine and the Nihilism of Mike Johnson. We're going to take a brief station break. We're back discussing how the recent alarm about the resurgence of illiberal democracy with Trump's capture of the GOP is seen as a departure from American tradition, but in fact it may be more of a recurring theme in American history. I have breathed all the sea. You're our fan, prophecy. Our destiny we will not hide When the sun comes up It will be on your side Welcome back. I'm Ian Masters and this is Background Briefing, available 24-7 at backgroundbriefing.org. And joining us now is Stephen Hahn, a Pulitzer Prize winning historian who studies American political and social movements and teaches at New York University. His acclaimed works include A Nation Under Our Feet and A Nation Without Borders. And his latest book just out is Illiberal America, A History. Welcome to Background Briefing, Stephen Hahn. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Well, thanks for joining us, uh, Stephen. And your book sort of explodes this current sense that we are facing fascism, uh, liberalism is on the rise, etc. in this country. But you place it in a more historical context and you dismantle the idea that the current situation is an, somehow an alarming departure from American tradition when in fact this is something that's in our, I don't know whether you say it's in our political DNA, but there have been strains of illiberalism. So how do we see this? Do you see this as an ebb and flow between illiberalism and liberalism? Well, you know, that's a very good question. And just a a bit of a backdrop. I got interested in this um, uh, during Trump's first campaign, not so much about Trump, but about how he was received uh, by journalists and other very well-educated people who were constantly talking about how he violated liberal democratic norms. And as a historian who uh, studies the 19th century, the 18th century, as well as the 20th, 
um, it was pretty clear to me that these so-called norms uh, are in many ways invented um, and people who were uh, speaking of them uh, had already lived through a couple of decades when the Republican Party was moving far to the right, the Supreme Court intervened in a presidential election, the court opened the spigot for big money, it uh, undermined the Voting Rights Act, so on and so forth, as, as individual states were doing. And I thought I would, you know, take this on uh, partly as a way of decentering liberalism. Uh, one of the things that strikes me about American historiography is that whether they um, uh, embrace it or criticize it, liberalism seems to be the central thread. And I'm not diminishing the significance of liberalism, but I see it as one of a number of political currents and uh, illiberalism, which admittedly is as a term is kind of tethered to liberalism. And I don't quite intend it that way because as you know from reading the book, um, I begin in a world that predated liberalism and where illiberal uh, relationships and ideas and cultures uh, not only predated it, but developed alongside uh, before uh, illiberalism and illiberals became entangled with liberalism. So how much, though, do liberals contribute or allow themselves to be sort of painted into a corner and be, well, I'd, let me put it another way. It <laughs> seems that liberalism and liberals in America's history have always been on the defensive, even though they've done the heavy lifting. You know, they ended slavery. They brought right. about civil rights, human rights, women's rights. They were warned about the Nazis when the, when the country was isolationist. I could go on. I mean, they've yes. really done, and, and all the conservatives have ever said and ever done over the decades and centuries is they've said no. They've, they've never mm -hmm. come up with an alternative. That's and, right. and when you think about the 1970s, we had a liberal Supreme Court with real liberals like Thurgood mm -hmm. Marshall and, and mm -hmm. William O. Douglas. The liberals dominated the Senate and the House, mm -hmm. and now they're in retreat. So right. what is it about liberals that they somehow can't take credit for what they've done, and why right. are they defensive when they've actually done the heavy lifting? Uh, well, I mean, that's a very big uh, question, and part of what I would say in terms of uh, what I've tried to do in my own book is in uh, tracing out the uh, history of illiberal America. What I was especially interested in doing was, because it's an episodic book, uh, what I was especially interested in doing was focusing on those moments in the past, uh, which we associate most clearly with the emergence and development of liberalism and suggest um, how liberalism and liberals kind of got entangled with uh, all sorts of illiberal dispositions. I would say that for the most part in U.S. history, uh, liberal liberals and people who are broadly on the left uh, have rarely been in power. Uh, they have accomplished really important things. And they have set certain standards that are extremely significant. But you mentioned the Supreme Court, you know, except for the decade, couple of decades, say between 1954 and the very early 1970s, the Supreme Court has always been an extremely conservative institution in many ways, uh, validating uh, Ill illiberal dispositions. You can think of Dred Scott and you can think of the response and uh, undermining of the Reconstruction Amendments. You can think of Plessy versus Ferguson, uh, the Lochner case that um, uh, undermined uh, collective bargaining and so on and so on, uh, certainly up to the uh, present day. I do think that in important ways, liberalism always had a very difficult time uh, living up to the standards that it set for itself. And that many people who either had liberal credentials or try to embrace them, uh, oftentimes fell back uh, when it came to a matter of maintaining order. To just give you one example, you know, I have a chapter in the book that focuses on the 
uh, emancip uh, on the Thirteenth Amendment and the so-called exception clause, you know, that says that um, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime, um, shall exist in the United States and any territory subject to its jurisdiction. And there's a lot of interest uh, in the exception clause, mostly in relationship to the emergence of the very brutal convict lease system in the South. But as it turns out, uh, convict labor was widespread in the North and Midwest uh, in the first half of the 19th century. And the architects uh, of the penitentiary were abolitionists uh, because they somehow saw a relationship, between, or at least they saw the penitentiary, at least in theory, uh, in relationship to enlightened ideas, and at the same time, very quickly embraced the use of corporal punishment, the use of um, convict labor. Um, and this was true, really, uh, when it came to emancipation, where they worried deeply, even though they thought that slavery was morally and politically objectionable, and they struggled against it, most of them had a very, except black abolitionists, most of them had a very difficult time envisioning a post-emancipation world, uh, imagining that people who had enslaved could act, who had been enslaved, could actually make a quote unquote adjustment to free society. In many ways, um, it kind of opens a window to the limitations of their views and to the ways in which illiberal sensibilities kind of penetrate all of this. And I guess what I was trying to do in the book is not talk about, you know, simply an occasional moment when um, illiberalism explodes, but the extent to which illiberal ideas and or forms of organization and perspectives and values have been close to the surface all the time. And uh, at certain moments of crisis, they do explode. But I think when you go back, you come to realize that, you know, the um, the times when uh, liberals and clearly liberal ideas uh, reigned were actually very few. So let's talk about then the the sort of tide of, of reactionary America and whether or not it dominates. And I think history indicates that it dominates more than these moments of liberalism that you just talked about. Yep. Uh, how much is it, you know, looking at Dred Scott, how that moment, and again, another moment of liberalism with Reconstruction that was yes. short-lived, how much is it the dark forces in this country tied to racism? Because if you look at the current situation with Donald Trump, many people think that the subtext of his racist dog whistles and the people that support him, mm -hmm. particularly the far right and mm -hmm. the Christian nationalists, etc., is about the fact that being simply born white nowadays no longer automatically confers privilege. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's, you know, that's a very important point. There's no question that race and enslavement and forms of racial uh, repression uh, have been a very significant component of American illiberalism as far back as we can go. You know, most uh, three quarters of the people who came uh, to North America between the early 17th century and the American Revolution were either enslaved or in a condition of servitude. Uh, what's also important to recognize is that racism, anti-Black racism, coexisted with all sorts of other forms of, um, of suppression and expulsion uh, that involved Catholics, for example, anti-Catholicism as one of the central components of American political culture really up until the middle of the uh, 20th century. Uh, in the 1830s, um, not only were Black people uh, expelled from their communities, but so, as you know, Native peoples, Mormons, Catholics, um, any kind of political dissident. The Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s was not so only, only against Black people, it was against Jews and Catholics. Um, and so what I would say is that there is this kind of um, uh, embrace and desire for 
forms of cultural homogeneity and the defining of internal as well as external enemies and the quick resort to expulsion as a way of dealing with this. Expulsion is a very deeply laid American tradition, and we've seen it in many, many respects, as is the idea of the will of the community uh, superseding the rule of law. Um, all of this, I think, is very much part of it. But as you said, clearly what is um, a, a characteristic of the particular moment is a widespread feeling among um, middle and lower middle class and some working class white people that the privileges that they believe they had enjoyed uh, have been uh, undermined, that they feel very vulnerable, and that uh, Donald Trump has been very uh, effective at tapping into their fears and vulnerabilities and somehow convincing them that he is a protector, that he's interested in them. And, you know, this has a long history too, which is, um, you know, somehow or other mixing a feeling about liberty on the ground with submission to forms of authority that offer protection. And I think, you know, I don't believe that Donald Trump has a deep knowledge of this at all, but he certainly understood people's fears. And, and over the last few decades, as we know, the industrialization, important demographic changes uh, have been uh, really very, very difficult for uh, many people in the United States, but certainly uh, for white people uh, who believed that they had uh, special lines and position and relationship to the state that went way, way back and feel that now they're being betrayed by the government, which in their view uh, has a client population of people of color. And now as it's represented of, you know, invading immigrants who they're going to use to maintain their own power. So I think, you know, the immigration issue also pulls together many of these illiberal threads, not only around racism, but around the kind of broad uh, ethnocentrism mm -hmm. and again, desire for cultural uniformity. It's not only whiteness, it's um, Christianity, uh, it's being native born. And uh, it, this goes way, way back. And, uh, you know, there, uh, I'm not trying to suggest that there's been no, you know, this is just a continuity story, which it is not, uh, nor am I trying to suggest that there's nothing else out there because there were, as you pointed out, important movements uh, that pursued expansive notions about rights, expansive notions about democracy, whether it was abolitionism or reconstruction, as you noted, in the 19th century, whether it's rights movements of many sorts in the second half of the 20th century. But um, these, you know, what we're looking at is 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 um, numbers of threads. Sure. And uh, illiberalism is a very powerful one. Well, just in the last couple of minutes, though, I wanted to touch on what liberals can do, and by extension, the Democrats and Biden, because you've got a conservative like Liz Cheney saying we're sleepwalking into dictatorship. And I recall, for example, when Kerry was running against George W. Bush, Carl right. uh, Rove came up with the swift boat thing where they yeah, right. took away yes. uh, Kerry's best asset, which was that he's a war hero. And his right. response was so feckless that he came across as a sort of gutless liberal mm -hmm. instead of really fighting back. And I think it's time for the Democrats to fight back and really go after this reactionary Supreme Court and and this absurd caricature of Trump, this criminal, possibly traitor. I mean, the whole thing is so grotesque. It's unbelievable that it's happening. In other words... Not to mention it, mocking people in the military. Right. Well, ha But is it all about the need for liberals to fight back as opposed to they'd rather be righteous than effective? Well, you know, it seems to me, uh, you know, I think the po point you're kind of getting at is that, you know, um, Democrats and liberals associated with the Democratic Party uh, have far more than Republicans and uh, conservatives and the uh, and the right and far right um, been uh, interested in playing by the rules of the game. 
and oftentimes losing. And uh, they've been outmaneuvered by the right uh, where, you know, they're interested in power and they're ready to go after it as um, as effectively as they can. You know, I think the difficulties for the Democratic Party now are a product of its changing character over recent decades. I mean, the party coming out of the New Deal had a very strong uh, base of organized labor uh, and also of, um, you know, liberal uh, internationalists. And over time, one of the things that's happened is that the labor movement has been, I mean, it's obviously on the march again, and that is probably one of the most interesting and um, encouraging signs uh, to be seen recently, but certainly over the decades since the 1970s, you know, organized labor has been badly hampered. The Democratic Party has been part of the processes of doing it. And so the Democratic Party has come to depend more on people who are socially liberal, well-educated, but economically more um, uh, cautious right. Uh, right. than the party would have been, you know, in the uh, 30s and then into the 1960s. I think this is part of the problem, which is that the party's uh, program and social democratic features uh, have been, you know, really withered in many respects. So that they, you know, depend us obviously a lot on minority voters. And even now, you know, as we know that uh, some of them, black male voters, some Hispanic voters, uh, maybe Asian American voters who had customarily been strong Democratic supporters, you know, are wondering about the Democratic Party. And I don't think it's all about, you know, what's going on internationally. I think the Democrat, I mean, Biden has, I think, been impressive in a lot of ways. I mean, he's <laughs> done better than I expected. Um, I think they need a clearer vision of what they represent and where they want to go. Um, and then to try to develop a, a, a coherent assortment of policies to get there. Uh, I think they tried to do that at the beginning of Biden's term. Obviously, there's been a lot of pushback against the progressive wing of the party, the so-called Green New Deal. You know, mm. at least the Democratic Party recognizes that we're facing an existential crisis of climate change. And um, and, and also plutocracy the, versus democracy, et cetera. I mean, well, we're well, facing so know, many. That's I've, right. But, you know, one of uh, the things that's really frightening and I think sort of speaks to my own concerns about the depth of illiberalism is that I am not convinced that all that many Americans could care less about democracy versus right. autocracy. I mean, we like right. to think that that's the case. Right. But um, I think they certain... care about plutocracy. I think that. That's... Well, but, you know, one of the things that's very interesting about this is the so-called, you know, right wing populism, uh, very much unlike the populism of the late 19th century. You know, their view of the elites are highly educated, professional type people, uh, people who are in intellectual life. Right. Uh, th there are plenty of plutocrats out there, and th that's not where they direct, you know, their uh, anger. I mean, the main course. plutocrat in chief is is Donald Trump. Right. Well, Stephen, I'm afraid we've run out of time, but I appreciate you joining us, and thank you for your book. Well, thank you for your questions. I really appreciate it. And again, I've been speaking with Stephen Hahn, who's a Pulitzer Prize-winning historian who studies American political and social movements and teaches at New York University. His acclaimed works include A Nation under our feet and a nation without borders and his latest book just out is illiberal america a history this has been background briefing i'm ian masters and i'd like to thank producer graham fitzgibbon and assistant producer evan green to help us sustain this program into the future and ensure it remains free to all please take a moment to support us by going to backgroundbriefing.org slash donate or publictruthmedia.org where you will find our non-profit Public Truth Media Foundation, where your tax-deductible donations, large and small, keep us broadcasting. And if you've missed any of today's programs or would like to explore our vast archives, you can find us at backgroundbriefing.org, where we include extended interviews searchable by topic and have made it easy for you to sign up for daily email updates that provide links to resources, articles, and books discussed on the program. Also, you can find links there to subscribe wherever you get your podcast, and we encourage your ratings and reviews on these platforms. Find us on Twitter and Facebook at Ian Masters Media, 
And please do help us reach more listeners by sharing this program with friends, family and colleagues. And I'll be back again tomorrow with another background briefing. Bye for now. The guy that lived next door in 305.